Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, Pakistan. This is Heather Mehdi and this is the voice of free Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your comments, criticism, uh, for your observations. And thank you to my patrons for supporting this program. This program is going to be in English uh, because I have a very important guest today to talk about uh, what's happening between the U.S. and Pakistan, the cipher story, the subsequent disclosures. But we will have subtitles. And so without further ado I'd like to introduce my guest uh, murtza hussain murtza welcome to the program thank you for having me heather your pleasure murtza murtza is the national uh, security correspondent and reporter for the intercept the famous intercept which i think has done more for pakistan in the last six months than the entire pakistani media has done for pakistan in 76 years maybe that's an exaggeration but certainly in the last two or three years we've seen an extremely destroyed bought over media in pakistan so murtza said first of all congratulations to you to ryan to intercept for what the wonderful work that you've done for pakistan in disclosing the contents of the cipher in august and then recently a couple of days ago the actual isi report so thank you very much for that well, thank you for featuring it and for having me on. So, Murtaza, uh, before we go on to the actual interview, could you tell us a little bit about The Intercept? You know, what is it and how did it come about? Uh, what do they do? Why are you guys so ferocious? <clears throat> sure, sure. I'm glad to. So I'm one of the original employees of The Intercept, so I can give a good history of it. Uh, the Intercept began in 2013, and it was actually created specifically to report on leaked documents from governments. That was one of mm. the main missions of The Intercept. Okay. And it was created specifically in response to a story then ongoing in the US, which was the Edward Snowden story. And Edward yes. Snowden, of course, he was an NSA contractor, who leaked uh, many, many documents from the US national security state. And I and my colleagues reported on those for a number of years. And but we always had the door open to reporting leaks from other countries too. So we've reported documents from Russia, from China, uh, from Iran, we had a very, very big uh, story a couple of years ago. So, you know, this is part of the modus operandi of The Intercept. It's a news outlet which does reporting, mostly stuff in the U.S., to be honest, American political news, but also leaked documents related to national security anywhere in the world. Um, so, you know, people come to us. You know, we had this, of course, this Pakistan story recently. We had an Indian story as well recently, leaked documents from India. We're not focused on one particular country, but we do report uh, very, very broadly on you know disclosures from any part of the world, which is relevant, and especially when it has some sort of tie to U.S. national security in a sense. Mm. But uh, that's kind of the origins of the Intercept, and you know it's a relatively popular website has millions of views a year, won many awards a month, sorry, won many awards, um, and we continue doing the same reporting. And this Pakistan reporting we've done is very much in line with the reporting we've done. On other countries and continue to do uh, day by day. Okay, so so that uh, um, that gives us a better sense that you're really uh, reporting on leaks worldwide and specifically which impact U.S. Uh, foreign policy and security interests. I I will uh, tell members on my views here. Uh, if you are watching this program and if you are uh, aware of what the Intercept has done for Pakistan by disclosing the cipher leak and the text of the entire uh, cipher text in August 2022. And then just a couple of days ago, maybe three or four days ago, they actually disclosed another text which you're going to be talking about. And you really want them to support democracy fearlessly across the world in Pakistan. Please become a member. You can become a member by, by, by uh, submitting your email and uh, you know you could actually make a donation to them this is a completely unsolicited thing burza and i have not discussed this i genuinely feel that that you people need to be supported so thank you very much and uh, you know let's move on towards the actual crux of the matter Murza, you guys disclosed this uh, uh, this event in august 9th in which the entire text of the uh, cipher, so-called cipher, was disclosed in which Donald Du actually literally threatens the ambassador, saying, "If you do this, then you're okay. If you don't this, then you're going to be serious trouble." And uh, I found the last paragraph of Majid's uh, uh, summary 
much more disturbing. And he said, I have a very strong sense that everything Donald Liu was saying also had the approval or, or came from the White House. To me, that was just not Donald Liu. What do you say to that? Well, you know, it's very interesting because it's very rare for a diplomat to issue a such a strident message to another country, uh, very unambiguous. If you read the cipher text, which is on the Intercept website, and anyone can go read it, uh, you can see it was very aggressive and hostile language used towards Pakistan. And very uncharacteristically, it got involved and expressed a very strong preference on the configuration of Pakistan's domestic politics. So that's very much overstepping normal diplomatic practice and how these conversations normally take place. So, you know, from Mr. Majid's standpoint, he would assume that such a strong message would not be freelanced by Don Lu. Diplomats, they talk with precision. That's the entire point of the job. You talk with great precision, you weigh every word. So for Don Lu to come up on this on his own or to deliver a message uh, that does not come from superiors, it was not approved by them, be very, very unlikely in a diplomatic standpoint. So Majid concluded that this must be coming from the White House. We haven't seen leaks or documents from the White House. We always welcome those sort of disclosures. But his conclusion is, has a logic to it. And he's a professional diplomat. He's a diplomat of many, many years. So is Donald Liu as well, too. So his interpretation of the conversation, I think, uh, should be taken seriously. And we saw in the aftermath of this story being disclosed, the U.S. government did not actually deny this, that this conversation took place. They didn't deny the substance of the conversation. They just simply deflected a bit and said that, you know, whatever is in the text does not represent pressure, quote unquote. I think people can read the text themselves and determine if it does, in, if it's pressure from the U.S. on Pakistan. And certainly my conclusion from reading it was clearly that it does. But more importantly, Majid's conclusion was that it does, was that it did. So... I think that it's very interesting, that conversation. I, I think that my own perspective, I share the view that it must have been coming from higher in the administration and not simply from Donald Liu, or even just from the State Department. Hmm. Because there was a uh, there was an attempt to downplay uh, this letter and this uh, conversation between Majid and Donald Liu in that uh, there is some internal rivalry going on between the State Department and the Bureau of uh, Middle Eastern and Southern uh, South Asia Affairs and some other parties. And Donald Lu kind of was trying to claw his way back into more prominence and he sort of stepped out of line. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't resonate, does it? Well, you know, it's very, very important context. If you look a few days before this conversation took place, Don Lu was brought before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yes. And he was grilled, effectively, given very, very harsh treatment about why countries in his area of responsibility in South Asia were not siding with the U.S. diplomatically on the conflict in Ukraine. And he was asked about Bangladesh, he was asked about uh, India, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. So if you look at it just from a bureaucratic standpoint, from his own incentives and State Department's incentives, they want countries in the region to evince support for U.S. foreign policy priorities. And failure to do that represents, you know, the way the Senate would view it is you're not doing your job properly. So fast forward a few days later, he's in this conversation with the Pakistani ambassador, and he seems to be letting his frustrations about this subject out. And of course, Imran Khan, when he was in power, he was very strident in his refusal to take a side in the Ukraine conflict. He didn't express himself diplomatically. He was very you know, bombastic in his way of expressing it. And you could say he was angry or he was confrontational about what he saw as pressure on Pakistan. So he wasn't very shy about his position. And it seems that this policy had antagonized the State Department. And they had come to view it, as per the text of the cipher, as a policy which was being devised and led by Khan himself. So if Khan was to be removed, then as Don Lu put it verbatim in the text of the cipher, all would be forgiven vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and U.S. relations. So they really viewed it, Don Lu viewed it as the issue, if you look at it from his perspective, you know, I'm getting a very hard time in my job from the Senate. It's very, very serious downward pressures coming on me from higher echelons of the U.S. government. Mm. And can I push that pressure further down onto my Pakistani interlocutors? Mm. The seriousness with which they took this message seems to be evidenced by how quickly they reacted to remove Khan from power and to take steps which would administratively accomplish that. And I will add that I don't say that 
the entire removal of Imran Khan was simply because the U.S. Department of government willed it. There's obviously an internal power struggle within Pakistan which was going on at that time. But the, the outcome of that was still uncertain. What the U.S. seems to have done is weighed in very, very strongly on one side of this mm. power struggle and done so in a way which is so extreme and was so you know, unambiguous about their own preferences of Pakistani politics that stakeholders inside Pakistan could not help but take it into account. Hmm. Very interesting. So, uh, <clears throat> what is a, uh, the, the other big unresolved question, the elephant in the room is, uh, who's your source and did you pay for it? And why did they come to you? Yeah, so for the second part of the question, we cannot pay any source. It would be very unethical and uh, completely against our practices journalistically and professionally. So we would never do that and we'd not do in this case and we would never do it in the future. Of course, we welcome sources from anywhere in the world to reach out to us with information, with tips, with documents and so forth. Uh, but we can't compensate people for that. They have to do it for some sense of their own, you know, whatever rationale they have, political, moral, whatever else it is, that's the only sort of reason you can do it. So who the source is, you know, what we wrote in the story is true, in the Cypher story, everything written there is true. It's someone from inside the Pakistani security establishment who was disillusioned with the unpopularity of the military as it's been developing since the removal of Imran Khan. Obviously the military historically has been a pretty popular institution in Pakistan, but now they've come up against a politician who polls show is the most popular politician in Pakistan. And this split has antagonized many Pakistanis, uh, people in Pakistan, in the diaspora, but also people evidently in the military itself, in the military, in the intelligence apparatus. Uh, there's clearly a lot of disillusion. And this impact of this disillusion, as the source put it, is impacting morale and the, the Pakistani security forces. Uh, it's impacting how the people, their relationship with society. So, you know, all that is true. And, you know, we don't go to people and solicit documents from them. We mm -hmm. just take what comes to us. So people come to us with a message and with information. You know, we don't report the vast majority of things we get. Only when things can be verified, uh, when we have great confidence, and when there's a public interest to report. And that's what happened in this case. So, so Murtza, I mean, without, I know, you, you know, it was... Um... It was just a rhetorical question asking you what your source is. I know you would never disclose it. But um, could you tell us a bit about the methodology or the rigor that you employed in verifying the authenticity of the source and the documentation? Is that possible? You know, I can't talk in great specifics about it because in doing so, it would potentially reveal sure. some information about that. What I can say is that we took really extraordinary steps to uh, verify this document and the information. We would not publish anything unless we had great confidence in the veracity of it. And you know that's the hardest and the most rigorous part of doing any story, to be honest, is the verification aspect. Writing it is you know, relatively straightforward, getting the context and details, uh, extracting the relevant information, that all can be done on your own. But verification is the hardest part, and we took very, very, you know, I would say very extraordinary steps, more than we would in a normal story to verify this document. And I think that what was validating for it afterwards, you know, obviously there's always some sense of, uh, you know what, normally, I'll give you an example, when we report stories on the U.S. national security state, uh, what we'll do is we'll go to the U.S. government and say, hey, we have this document, um, you know, we are going to report it. Will you verify for us? And if you verify for us, we will give you the opportunity to know what we're writing and you can express objections to certain mm. aspects of it if you think that there are things which are not in the public interest but could harm people. And with the Snowden, Edward Snowden documents, that's what we did. There was a misconception that, uh, you know, our publication or others were like WikiLeaks and we're just dumping documents out there. That's not the case at all. Um, we talked to the US government quite a bit. And they didn't have a veto who we reported, but they certainly had, uh, they were stakeholders because the fact they gave us verification, we gave them the opportunity to tell us what should not be published, which is not in the public interest and could harm a source of them or could harm the public or something like that. You know, in the case of Pakistan, we can't do that. The Pakistan government, we reached out to them. They didn't respond. They didn't want to uh, engage in this back and forth quid pro quo, you could say, for 
you know, cooperation for reporting. And that's pretty common for most governments, to be honest. The Iranian government doesn't work with us. The Chinese government doesn't work with us. Mm. Uh, because I guess, you know, we're a U.S. publication and, you know, it's a different different dynamic. So, you know, in this case, we couldn't do that with the Fox News. So we had to operate on our own verification without them confirming it on their side. But what was good is, you know, a few days after, Nawaz Sharif, oh, sorry, Shabash Sharif, uh, verified the document. He said the disclosure of the cipher was a great crime. That's the way he described it, referring <laughs> to our story. So, you know, that was the highest yeah. level of verification we can ask for. Yeah. But yeah. the Prime Minister himself to comment on the story thereafter and say, you know, didn't like it, but said that, mm-hmm. you know, it did happen. So that's kind of the dynamics of how it works normally. And I encourage the Pakistani government, other governments in the future, when we reach out to them, you should talk to us. You should, you know, mm-hmm. get, confirm things. And if you do that, then you can also have a say in, you know, knowing what the story is before it publishes and having at least a sense, a say and a stake in, you know, the framing or the full details of the story as it comes out. It's very rare that we publish full documents, by the way, too, because we don't want to endanger people hmm. uh, unduly. We just want the information to be out there. Only that which is useful to the public. Hmm. Well, what's that, uh, in, this, in this particular case, which were the specific uh, departments, organizations, or ministries that you reached out to in Pakistan, in the U.S. and within Pakistan? Typically, for any foreign government, we reach out to the U.S. Embassy and consulates in the U.S., and they would handle which department in okay. the government it's uh, it's most appropriate to be sent to. So, so you did reach out to the Pakistan Embassy in D.C., the ambassador or somebody there, and said, "Hey, this is what we have. Is there something that you want to say about it? Do you want to come back to us, etc.?" Yes. Every time, every time, every they will time. have they, they will know about the story before it publishes at least twenty four hours, if not more. Okay, so which means Ambassador Masood Khan. I'm just trying to kind of put context to this. Ambassador Masood Khan, the embassy in Washington, did know about it, and clearly, if they did know about it, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would know about it, and if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs knows about it, the government, the ISI, the military, everyone would be aware that you had this document, you have reached out, and you were looking for some validation, verification, or an answer, right? Am I correct in that? Absolutely, absolutely, that's the case. They would know every single time, and uh, you know that's the case for the U.S. government, for the Iranian government, the Pakistani government. It's never a surprise, per se, until when it comes out. They have some hmm. lead time, and they can respond to us and communicate with us in that time, and uh, that's always... Uh, it would be dereliction of duty for us not to tell them beforehand. They need to have a chance to comment. And if they take a chance, then their comment will be included in the story for sure. Excellent. So to date, has anyone responded with any response or it's just silence or it's just no comment or it's just you guys are lying? Well, you know, in the first story, obviously there was a huge response. Uh, you know, it became a gigantic story. The yes. prime minister at the time exiting prime minister at the time responded uh there was significant uh you know discussion of it in the high levels of pakistani government yeah. they didn't really call it fake they kind of ignored they didn't say it was real either but they also sort of said verified implicitly that it was real by denouncing the fact that it had been leaked but but that was after you published it what i'm saying is before, before you re- no there's no response none at all right no. it was only after you published it that we had this furor right yeah, that's right. Mm. But before that, absolutely nothing. No, they don't. Wow, amazing. All right. So uh, I think the two things that your source mentioned, which you do state in your article, is that they're using the the death of the Shaheeds uh, to further their own political agenda. He's talking about the Pakistan army, your source. And I think the second one that is heading towards uh, a similar situation as the dismemberment of Pakistan in 1971. These are two really very powerful, massively, uh, potentially inflammable uh, underlying reasons that this person uh, or persons uh, reached out. Did you did, did, did that strike you as something significant when you read these two things about them? Well, you know, anyone who's familiar with uh, Pakistan's culture and institutional culture knows that the military is a very important and proud institution in Pakistani history. 
And obviously, the soldiers who died in combat, they were very honored in Pakistani society uh, in any time, peacetime or wartime. And second to that, you know, the loss of Bangladesh was a significant national trauma of Pakistan's. But the biggest national trauma since partition was the loss of Bangladesh. So to invoke both these hmm. ideas, these concepts, you know, it certainly speaks to something on their side of how they view yeah. this, the gravity with which they view the situation. And I think it's something which, you know, Americans may not understand that message per se. It's mm. a message which is very tailored to Pakistanis because, yes. you know, yes. you have to be familiar with Pakistan a bit to know how important soldiers are in Pakistan's life because the l l lost lives of soldiers are in Pakistani culture. And then secondly, Bangladesh, how important that is. So I think that one thing that maybe you've antagonized people is that in the campaign against uh, Imran Khan, by the military, the lives of sold shaheeds were used as sort of like, you know, a tool to mm. uh, increase or to manipulate the emotions of the public, uh, you know, on the part of the military. So perhaps, you know, politicizing that subject would antagonize people who themselves are part of the military. That's my own speculation. And mm. that I think it comports with what the source said. But mm. yeah, certainly Pakistanis will feel the strength of that message more so than you know other people would or oh, it does it it does you know uh, of course i've read your story several times this particular these two uh issues really uh, kind of jumped out at me every time and i think that that's really really huge because truly uh, a lot of people in pakistan especially the, the civilian side uh, think that this is uh, being used to promote the military's interests which are completely non-patriotic but coming back to uh, i'm taking, going to take a last stab at the source thing was it this person in uniform or a civilian member of the security establishment uh you know they describe themselves as a member of the security establishment okay. part okay. of the broad military intelligence establishment of pakistan so okay. that's all we can really all right you know, okay about. moving on uh Munza, to this uh to the second expose that you guys had that was that was dynamite uh, how did that happen? Was it again just uh, so? So sorry. Quick question. Quick uh, uh, a request from you. If someone wants to send you a a leak or something, what's the best way to get to you? If you want to send it to me myself, you can email me. But okay. you know, we also have on the Intercept website, uh, we have a signal uh, message. We have a secure drop. There, there's a section on the website how to become a source. On the intercept side, maybe I can share the link to oh, you. There is, is there? Okay, I'm on yeah. the website right now. Where do I go? Well, you can let me see if I can send you. Okay, I'll put that in the description of the program. Yeah, do, yeah, do yeah. Send let, it me, to me. let me let me send it to you right now. Become the, a source. Uh, okay. chat. Become yeah. a source. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is another, and I, I would say if you're going to do this, you know, not I'm not talking about anyone in Pakistan or anywhere in the world specifically. Anyone who listens to this and, and anywhere they are in the world, I would recommend using a secure browser like Tor or yeah. something like that, which you know to have some digital security. You can also reach out to me by email. My email is encrypted. All my colleagues' emails are encrypted as well too. So you know you could do that. And this is how we get a lot of tips through this mm -hmm. method: so Signal messages, Signal is an encrypted messaging app, and the other tools we lay out there but even if you navigate to the site use the tor browser which you can download which will conceal your ip address yeah uh, and yeah this is just general right. advice we give to anyone in the world yeah. right it. here so you've got your secure drop as well okay uh you know the reason i'm doing this really is uh, not just only to help you guys but really to help pakistan you know there is such a dearth of accurate correct information coming out and People like myself, we, we, we also look for information, but I think coming to you, uh, one of the reasons they come, they came to you, and maybe maybe that's a question you probably didn't address in detail, is that they come to you because they believe that there's a far greater impact that you people have in America, and therefore it may influence American policymakers and decision makers. Is that is that the reason people come to you? You know, I think that... You know, there's a number of reasons that could be a reason, but also I think there are not a lot of publications in the world who are actually able to do this kind of reporting. And I say mm -hmm. that in two ways. First, technically, it's very difficult. You need to have, it takes a big team of people to do this reporting, different mm -hmm. technical skills, 
uh, security skills, uh, you know, knowing professionally how to deal with leaked documents. I've uh, dealt with leaked documents, classified documents. I was thinking about the other day from, I think, five countries now. The United States, India, Iran, Pakistan, and there's one other I'm forgetting at the moment. But, yeah, yeah. so, you know, four or five different countries have dealt with leaked documents. It's not easy to know how to do that. What to do, if you just give it to a random person or even a random reporter, they may not be able to actually report it because they don't know how yeah. what steps to take and so forth so myself and my colleagues we know it's a thing we do and there are not a lot of places in the world know how to do that to be honest that's mm-hmm. one thing politically we're also able to do it because we don't have any you know we're not funded by any one particular person with a particular line we have independence mm-hmm. that way we're not the new york times the washington post we were compromised in some cases by affiliations with powerful institutions governments and things like that we're very small uh, scrappy news outlet, uh, yeah. which is a very, very independent. So for that reason, you know, you can come to us, we can actually report the story. And yeah, it's a U.S. publication. So obviously, if there's a U.S. angle, it helps a lot in generating readership. Uh, it makes it easier for us to report in some sense or to not market the story, but to publicize the story in a way. That's another aspect. But I think the main reason people come to us, they should come to us, is because we're actually able to do this reporting. We can do it. And I think the cipher... I don't think there's any other news outlet which could have done this cipher reporting. If they give really? it to, I don't wow. think so. I don't think so. And I say that honestly, my honest opinion, because if they give it to the New York Times, the Washington Post, I don't know if they would have reported. I don't know if their local reporters would have been willing to do it. You know, they would have had political reasons, maybe not to in many cases, or they would have framed it in a completely different manner, yeah. uh, which you know undercut the actual significance of it in a significant way. I'll tell you one quick example. When the story came out, the New York Times reporter in Pakistan actually attacked the story. He actually was speculating about the source. He was, you know, saying a lot of this and that. Mm-hmm. You know, he did not surface the cipher himself, even though he had all the resources, resources of the New York Times available. Yes. He just sort of uh, sniped at the story thereafter. Yeah. So it lead me, led me to believe that had the source given the story to the New York Times, a person in Pakistan, they would have buried it. They would have maybe tried to work with the ISI to find the source, you know, something like that, given maybe they have very close relationships. So I think it's telling that they chose the intercept because of the independence of the intercept and also the mm-hmm. abilities of the intercept. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that's why it happened. Excellent. Thank you. So this current expose on the ISI uh, report to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, asking them, saying, hey, did it matter if Imran waived it and said it, etc.? So do you have the actual report or were these uh, extracts that you were provided by your source? Uh, pretty much every story we do, we'd actually have access to the full uh, documentation because we need to be able to contextualize it in the proper yes. way. And if we only have extracts, then you could be falsely portrayed and we can't really report that because we need to know the full context of it. I will say for con- for further context, we had a couple stories in between the story, which also came out. Uh, one was about Indian raw assassinations. Yes, yes. Like, Sikh and Kashmiri activists in Harjit Singh Najjar, yes. Harjit Singh Najjar, yes, the, the Canadian Sikh activist was killed, and others with ties to Canada or ties to Pakistan, Sikhs who were, you know, killed or believed to have been killed in recent years. That also leaked out from another totally separate branch of the Pakistani government, and we also had an Indian story which came out also about this issue of uh, Hardeep Singh Najjar, uh, mm. but that came out from the Indian side, India, India's Ministry of External Affairs. Oh, and wow. then we had the story. Yeah, and then we had the story from Pakistan, from this ISI document. So what I'll say generally is that, you know, obviously there are many, many different agencies, you know, spans, you know, huge numbers of agencies. That ISI document is shared also very broadly within the Pakistani government. And further, you know, just for context, Western intelligence agencies have penetrated clearly many aspects of India's you know, communications in recent years that you see all the leaks coming out about this uh, Hardeep Singh Nijar case and the other case in New York. And, you know, they also surveil Pakistan quite intensively as well, too. So these documents, you know, they are dis- disseminated far broader than anyone even knows for sure. They're disseminated wow. internally in Pakistan and disseminated internally in India. They're disseminated in Canada, in the United States. So, you know, when you think of sourcing, it's a very, very broad subject. And where to start, it seems it's not always obvious to know where to start. Mm-hmm. So that's something that 
that people should keep in mind when reporting it. And I will say that everything we report in our story, details about our sources, is always 100% accurate and true about where they came from. Mutsa, what how long does it take you to verify, uh, you know, how long did it, for example, take you to verify the cipher, the initial report, and then this one, the, uh, the the second expose on the ISI report saying that the cipher is absolutely not a security risk, even if someone has the plain text, as well as the encrypted uh, portion. It takes a long time to to verify because we have to verify. We have to. Are we talking to months? Are we talking months or weeks? Well, you know what I'll say is that sometimes we get documents we have and we still have. We never verify them, and we never mm -hmm. get reported. Yeah, mm -hmm. the really interesting and possibly true things uh, sometimes are very explosive. They just don't get reported because we don't have the ability to verify that they're real or not, and that happens. And that's disappointing when it happens, but that's just part of. Uh, part of the, the game, so to speak. So, you know, that's one aspect of it. Some things can take months to get verified. We had some projects in the past because they were so big and there were so many documents to verify. It took a very, very long time to do that. And some of them, I'll say as a rule, the shorter and less information there is, usually it's a bit easier to verify. You can do that in many ways. You can do that you know, through technical means, through digital means. Uh, through forensic means, you can have sources who can verify it for you. Uh, it all depends, but I think every case is a bit context specific. Uh, and multiple variables. Mm -hmm. Mozart, well, coming to the last part of the question, thank you so much. That really, really adds a lot of context to the, the story because I think it's really this behind the scenes and how you guys work and what you do and why people come to you and why you do this work is is more important is more important for people to know so that they can understand, you know, that there are no motives underlying motives that you guys do it other than the, the you know the truth they're seeking the truth and that's why no corporate advertiser would come to you and put their advertising on your on your intercept um so asim's current visit he's been there now maybe 10 or 11 days and uh, what do you make of it you know it's very interesting because it's not totally clear what the agenda is for the visit. Certainly, whatever has been disclosed publicly is very high level, and you can say vague. I think that if you look at the uh, pattern of Pakistani history, Pakistan has always tried to, especially the military, has always tried to make itself strategically useful to the United States. And during the Cold War, they knew how to do that. During the War on Terror, they knew how to do that. And you know, today it's not really clear how Pakistan can be useful. They're selling arms to Ukraine through the United States, which the Intercept also reported on earlier this year. That's sort oh, of yes, a minor... that was big one. That was huge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that sort of a minor, uh, you could say, role that Pakistan's playing. So I do wonder how, you know, what Asim Munir discussed with his counterparts, because you know, it's not Pakistan. I'll give you just my perspective. Pakistan's not discussed a lot in the US at the moment in DC. It's not really on anyone's agenda. It's not considered to be important or, you know, prominent in US policymakers discussions. It's sort of, you know, they're focused on, they have other fish to fry. They're in Eastern Europe, they're worried about China, they're dealing with Israel and Gaza. You know, Pakistan does not fit in anywhere here. And they're a bit, you know, tired of Pakistan. They feel that it just doesn't never makes any progress economically stagnant its uh, economy is a bit parasitic on you know ex infusions of external cash it's not very popular i would say at the moment in the in the us and policy making circles so you know Aston Manier to go to us you know at the same time though they must see some reason that they want to talk to him. some mm -hmm. reason that they're asking for so i will wait to see what developments you know emerge in the horizon and i think one you know thing which could be the case is that pakistan obviously developed a very close relationship with china in recent years u.s china competition is becoming more and more acute with every passing month you know yesterday two days ago it was reported that xi jinping told joe biden he plans to take back taiwan you know he prefers to it peacefully but maybe not so how pakistan fits into that could be very important and despite all Pakistan's dysfunctions, it's still, by some measure, the sixth biggest military in the world. It's a very, very overdeveloped military industrial complex. It could be useful in some, some scenarios. And from Pakistan's perspective, to balance its relationship with China with the relationship with the U.S., it's probably very, very important.
because to be boxed in on one side in a future conflict between China and the U.S. Uh, could have very, very negative, you know, consequences for Pakistan. So, you know, I can't really speculate because I don't know. I have any evidence or any documentation to show otherwise. But I think they're probably discussing how Pakistan could be useful to the U.S. given the U.S.'s emerging challenges. Do you, do you think that's a sustainable objective that the U.S. is looking for in trying to woo Pakistan away from China and expect it to side with them in, in a future economic or in you know, some kind of conflict? I think it's not a very realistic uh, goal on the part of the U.S. because obviously Pakistan is very close to China, the neighbor of China. They have a relationship with China and they have close military and strategic cooperation between China as well too but China is not such a great partner for Pakistan on one hand you know mm-hmm. they their economic investments are very parasitic in many ways um you know by many people's accounts they don't seem to have you know many many shortcomings they don't seem to have the same sort of uh, close relationship that Pakistan would like to enjoy with China I'm sure China is the hesitant party in this case, um, for the most part. They have, they have no reason to be so close to Pakistan as Pakistan would like. Mm. So mm. I think that, you know, more likely, better goal for both sides is to have a balanced relationship. You know, Pakistan should mm. not be wedded to one camp <laughs> either way if they're mm. stuck with China. China's not many allies, if you look at it this way. They have very, very few allies. U.S., mm. you know, for all faults, has many, many allies. So Pakistan should try, I, I would imagine, to try to be on the U.S.'s good side and also China's good side as much as possible. And if there's a conflict, to take as neutral and, you know, as mutually balanced position as it can to avoid being, taking the brunt of the other side's anger. Mudza, I would love to have another conversation with you on specifically this subject of the balanced relationship and specifically on what that would look like. But for now, my last question for you. you you've seen many Pakistan army chiefs visiting the U.S. and you've seen this guy. Would you, would you classify this visit as successful, unsuccessful? Were there great symbolism of honoring this guy or was he just kind of brushed under the carpet? Well, you know, it's a bit strange in some ways because he's not the head of state of Pakistan, at least on paper. The, on yes. paper, he's a civilian head of state. So yes. there was not all the same, uh, you know, welcoming and ceremonies that you might see from a head of state. I think there was one picture of him with Lincoln, you know, that was shaking hands. And also, I think the ISI chief was also in that photo as well, too. That's basically it. And the visit was not discussed at all in the U.S. There was pretty much no news coverage. There was no acknowledgement of it. Uh, there was no public recognition or consciousness that he was here. Contrast that with when Modi came to the U.S., there was a... Or Bajwa. I, I, you know, in, Bajwa. instead of comparing it with Modi, I mean, comparing it with Bajwa, who was also an army chief. Right, right. Yeah? Much more, much more, much more uh, recognition. So I think it's emblematic of Pakistan's decreased uh, centrality to U.S. concerns mm. post-Afghanistan as well, too. So I think that that's the aspect of it. Also, Pakistan has elections coming up. And, mm. you know, and also one last thing too, one other aspect of it and it cannot be ignored is that Imran Khan is very, very popular in the Pakistani American diaspora. He's extremely mm. popular. So to give a huge welcome to Asim Munir, it would be very polarizing. And mm. I'm not to say that Pakistani Americans are a huge voting bloc, but they're disproportionately well off and they're vocal and they're educated. And if they were to see the U.S. government seemingly slighting their preferred candidate who's in jail at the behest of the army chief, it yeah. could cause a headache for the U.S. that they would not want to have otherwise. They're not willing to or able to embrace Asim Munir even if they wanted to because there are political considerations domestically in the U.S. So I think all those factors mm, lay behind a relatively muted reception. And was it successful or not? It's hard to see because we don't know what was discussed behind closed doors. No mm. one's shared the information. But I would say from a public relations standpoint, I would not characterize it as a great event in U.S.-Pakistani relations. Morto, thank you very much. I think the biggest message I, I heard coming out from you, other than how you do your stuff, is really that we're, we're nowhere near on top of the interest ladder as far as the U.S. is concerned. We're just... a an irritant on the side that, you know, it doesn't go away. It's a fly that keeps buzzing in and they swat it away. Is, is that kind of a, in, in, in symbolism, is this something that, that also 
resonates with you? Well, you know, I don't want to characterize it that way because obviously Pakistan is an important country in its own terms, but the 200 million mm -hmm. people who live there has a lot of potential. There are a lot of... Uh, yeah, oh, yes, we know that, but I'm just saying from the yeah. U.S.'s perspective. Yeah, I would say that they just they view Pakistan as a uh, kind of a problem which does not go away. And, you know, they would like, I think, Pakistan to do well. They would like Pakistan to develop economically, to be peaceful and stable. They don't want to destabilize Pakistan because it would create a big problem for them as well, too. Um, but, you know, I don't think that the political economy of Pakistan is optimized to do that at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. problem. And I don't see any change of that on the horizon until this you know kind of warped elite driven military controlled economy isn't liberalized so the people of Pakistan can actually act on their own it will remain sort of irritant and it will be treated in a manner which is far far junior to India by people in DC as we're seeing today but they are uh, Pakistani five millimeter, millimeter, one hundred fifty-five millimeter howitzer shells finding their way to Gaza in the Israeli arsenal. I've seen some reporting about that in Indian press. I don't see any evidence of that. The Indian reports seem to be very poorly substantiated. I would say they're almost like psychological warfare. Like hmm. that's the purpose of those reports. I don't put a lot of credence in them. At least what I've seen so far. Hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say that. You know, when Pakistan sells arms, there are end user contracts. So end user contracts, you know, something specifies who should actually use the weapons that are being sold. Ultimately, I haven't seen any documents saying that the end user would be Israel. Um, likewise, though, when you sell, they're selling it brokered to the U.S. We don't know what the U.S. does with them. That's also an aspect of it. So I would say that, you know, when you have a very opaque government, people will start speculating about these things. And then you can't prove it or disprove it one way or another. If you believe it's happening, you may continue believing that and yes. until someone provides evidence. Otherwise, if someone has evidence, I'd love to see it, but I haven't seen anything at this time. Morza, thank you very much. And uh, do I have uh, the, uh, can I take you up on your offer on the balancing of the China Pakistan relationship in the next few weeks sometimes? Anytime you like to talk, either, I'm glad to talk. I really enjoyed it. L lovely, Morza. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was Morza Hussain from The Intercept. Please support The Intercept. This is one media outlet in the U.S. where your voice will be heard. And I have uh, this uh, uh, banner at the end, which is, if you want to share leak stories, please don't spam them with useless information. Only if it is accurate, verifiable, uh, please send them these documents to The Intercept so that your voice and the voice of free Pakistan can be heard across the world. Mutsa Hussain, thank you very much for being there. Inshallah, we will meet again. Pakistan Zindabad, Pakistan Pahindabad. Thank you, Mutsa. Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you.